this week's parish of Har B'chukhasai contains the Teichacha. And uh, many times we've quoted the Gemara Megillah, which says that Ezra made a Takana that we should read the Teichacha of Sefer Vayikra, Parshish B'chukhasai, before Shavuos, and the Teichacha of Kisava, which is Sefer Tvarim, before Rosh Hashanah. The year and its curses should end. So the Gemara says, I understand that uh, the Teichach of Devarim is before Rosh Hashanah, it's the end of the year. In what sense is Shavuos the end of the year? So the Gemara says that Atzeres is not in Rosh Hashanah. Atzeres is also the beginning of the new year, because the Mishnah says in Rosh Hashanah that Atzeres were judged on Peres of Elam. So it's also Yem Hadin. It's the beginning of a new year for Peres or Elam, and if it's appropriate, then we read the Teichacha before Shavuos, the year and its curses should end. We've said this more many times. We've raised the question, is there any reason why this particular Teichacha is read at this particular time? In other words, is there a reason that it's the Teichacha of Fayikra that's said before Shavuos and not before Shoshana? And is there a reason that it's the Teichach of Devarim, which is written before Rosh Hashanah and not before Shavuos? And we've discussed this in many different ways over the years. But one point that we've never made is that in a historical sense, the Teichach of Sefer Fayyukur, the Teichach of Chukosai, has a very, very direct kesher to the whole story of Matan Teir. And it makes perfect sense that it should be this Teichach the version of Parshas B'chukosai, which is read before Shavuos. And to understand this, we have to have a little bit of background as to the entire structure of Parshas Bahar B'chukosai and its place in Sefer Vayikra. Because we know that uh, the Torah was given in Sefer Shemos, in Parshas Yisrael, we read of the Maimur Ar Sinai, and the command to build the Mishkan, and Sefer Shemos concludes with the completion of the Mishka. Sefer Vayikra begins with HaKadosh Baruch speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu from the Olam from the Mishka. And we know that from the time that the Mishka was built, HaKadosh Baruch no longer spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu at Har Sinai. Rather, HaKadosh Baruch spoke from the Mishka. So the Parshias, Vayikra, Tzav, Shemini, Tzviyah, Metzayra, Achimos, Kedoshim, Elmor, all the mitzvahs in those Parshias, were presumably given in the Oyal Mayid after the Mishkan was built. We come to Pasha's Bahar, and all of a sudden the Torah begins to discuss Mitzvahs that were given on Har Sinai. So Hashem spoke to Moshe on Har Sinai, and he gave the Mitzvah of Shemitah and Yoyvel. And that takes us through Pasha's Bahar into Pasha's Bechukosai, and the Teichacha concludes with the following verse. These are the various laws. Asher Nasan Hashem Beinov and Bnei Yisrael, that Hashem gave between Himself and the Bnei Yisrael, Bahar Sinai, at Har Sinai, Biad Moshe. So uh, we have bookends in a sense, that the beginning of Pashas Bahar and the end of Pashas Bechukosai are framed that these two Pashas really were set in Har Sinai, which means chronologically, Lachorah they really predate the beginning of Sefer Vayikra. These were parashiyas that presumably were said before the Mishkan was built. So why are they placed here at the end of Parshas uh, Sefer Vayikra? So of course we could say a Mukta Mukha Batayra, the Torah isn't in strict chronological order, but it requires an explanation. But why did the Torah take these two parashiyas, which were presumably said before, and place them over here? So the Ramban, in the beginning of Parshas Bahar, is a long arichos to uh, resolve this question. And the Ramban says an amazing thing. The Ramban says we know that after the revelation on Har Sinai, which was either on the 6th of Sivan or the 7th of Sivan, that's in Machlokas and Chazal, but after the revelation, there was a krisas bris. There was a covenant that was made. Now, this statement of the Ramban, by the way, is the Ramban Lishi Tosa. Because the story of this Krisas Bris is in the end of Parshas Mishpatim. And Rashi Shita, really based on the Gemara, is that that entire story of the Krisas Bris took place before the revelation. 
on the fifth of Sivan. But the sheet of the Ramban back there in Parshas Mishpatim is that the Parsha is al Seder, the Parshas are in chronological order, and that Krisas Bris took place after the revelation. So the revelation was on the sixth or seventh of Sivan. And before Moshe Rabbeinu went up for the 40 days to receive the rest of the Torah, there was a ceremony of a Krisas Bris. And what did that ceremony involve? It involved several things. It says that Moshe Rabbeinu read the Sefer Habris. He read the Sefer Habris. So what did the Sefer Habris consist of? The Ramban sheet is the Sefer Habris was the entire Torah, including the mitzvahs that were given in Parshas Mishpatim. Now the Ramban sheet is that the mitzvahs of Parshas Mishpatim were not given in the 40 days. They were given before the 40 days. They were given after the Aseris of Dibris, before Moshe Man went up for the 40 days. He was given those mitzvahs, and those were incorporated into the Sefer Abris, and the Sefer Abris was read for the people. And there were korbanos, and the blood was sprinkled on the people, and there was an acceptance of the covenant. They said, Kol HaShedibra Hashem Nasa Venishma. So that entire ceremony, which is described back there in Perak Havdalad, in Sefer Shmos, this is the Krisas Abris. This is the covenant that was made between the Kodesh Baruch and the Bnei Yisrael on the Torah. That's the Roman explains. That covenant was destroyed with the Chet Ha'egel. When Klai Yisrael sinned at the Chet Ha'egel, that covenant says the Roman was Nizbatel, that covenant was violated, it was annulled, it was cancelled, and there was a need for a new bris. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted there should be a new bris over the Torah. Where do we see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted a new bris? So there's a remit to this in Pasha's Kisisa. In Pasha's Kisisa, after HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives Moshe Rabbeinu the second Luchas, he says, Hinei Anochi Kareis Bris. I am going to make a covenant. So Ramban says that covenant means a second covenant to replace the first covenant. The first covenant was destroyed by the Chet Ego. Now there has to be a new covenant on the, on the Torah. So the Ramban says, what does this new covenant entail? What was different? In what way was the second covenant different than the first covenant? So the Ramban says there were two differences. One is that the first covenant had no brachas of klalos. Then the first covenant that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made, there were no blessings and curses. The mitzvahs were given, but there were no blessings and curses. The second covenant required brachas and klalas. And therefore, part of the second covenant is the teich al b'chukosai. The teich al b'chukosai is the, are the brachas and klalas of the second covenant. And then the Ramam says something else, that in the second covenant, there was an expansion of the laws of Shemitah. If you go back to Parshas Mishpatim, which is part of the Sefer Abris, there's a very short reference to the halachas of Shemitah. It says, You should abandon the fields. And the poor should eat. And the leftovers should eat by the animals. That's it. That's all the Torah talks about Shemitah. And here, as part of the new bris, there's an expansion of the laws of Shemitah and Yoivo, and that's the beginning of Parshas Bahar. That's one difference. Another difference, that's the second difference, I should say. So there are two differences. Again, one difference is that in the second bris there are brachas and klalas, and in the first bris there are no brachas and klalas. The other difference is that in the second bris the laws of Shemitah and Yoivo are expanded, and in the first bris the laws of Shemitah and Yoivo are, are the kisser. Now, why those differences are, is a good question. In other words, why does the second bris have to be any different than the first bris that we're going to discuss? This is what Ramban says. So Ramban says, when Moshe came down with the second luchas, he got sidetracked because he gave the instructions for building the Mishkan. And then Klaus was involved in building the Mishkan. And then... Akkad Baruch gave Moshe Benu many mitzvahs in the Mishkan that pertained to the Korbanos, etc., the laws of Tum and Tara, which are the parashiyas of Sefer Vayikra. And after all those parashiyas were given, Moshe Benu got back on track, and Moshe Rabbeinu told the Bnei Yisrael 
about the mitzvahs that were given in the final 40 days, the mitzvah of Shemitah and Yaibo, and the second bris was made. So although the parashiyas of Bahar B'chukosai were said by Akhavaz Baruch to Moshe Rabbeinu back in Harsinai, they were written here because this really is their proper place, because it was only after Parshas Emor that Moshe Rabbeinu passed them on to the Bnei Yisrael. So the Ramban says that the parashiyas are in beautiful, lovely historical order. In other words, it's true that Akhavaz Baruch gave these parashiyas to Moshe Rabbeinu earlier, but Moshe Rabbeinu only passed them on to the Jewish people at this point. And that's why they are the conclusion of Sefer Yekra. This is what the Ramban says. But this much, the Ramban tells us, that Parshas Baharam B'chukosai, not just mitzvahs and, and warnings, they are really part of the new bris that was made on Kabbalah Sater. That the first bris collapsed with the Chet Egel, and there had to be a new bris on the Kabbalah Sater, and that's what Baharam B'chukosai are. Bahar is the expansion of the Sefer Abris to include the Klolim and Pratim of Shemitah. B'chukosai are the Brachas and Klolos, which are a necessary element in the second bris. And uh, therefore, this is really the, the new Kabbalah Satira, if you will. So I think we understand Lefizeh, we understand why this is relevant, particularly before Shavuos. Now, it's not the Mikra that it's B'chukos have to read before Shavuos, as opposed to Kisav, just, isn't it, it happens to work out that way. It's Dafka B'chukosai, because somehow B'chukosai is the Tikkun for the problem of the Kabbalah Satara of Shavuos. That there was something that didn't work in the Kabbalah Satara of Shavuos, and there was a consequence of the Chet Ego, and that is really only rectified with the second bris of B'chukosai, and that's why it's after this parasha, which was read before Shavuos. Now, the other parasha has no historical relevance to Shavuos. But parasha's B'chukosai is, 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 is unusually relevant to Shavuos, because B'chukosai is the tikkun for what went wrong on Shavuos. Now, I'll mention this very interesting thing, that you know, in the Torah, there's no explicit connection of the Yant of Shavuos to Kabbalah Satayr. If you look back in last week's parasha, Parsha, uh, the, the Yom Tov of Shuas is mentioned only as the celebration of the Shtei Halechem, the uh, special carbon that is brought of the new wheat. There's no explicit connection of the Yom Tov of Shuas to, to the Kabbalah Sater. And the question is asked why, and there are many answers given to this question. One of the answers which is given is because, in a sense, the Kabbalah Sater of Shuas has no lasting value, it seems. Because whatever was accepted on Shavuos, Lukhar became canceled, no, with the Chet Now, whether that answers the question, I don't know. But it's a fact that Svarim do say this. And therefore, Parshas B'chukosai has an urgency, because if anything, it is somehow the rectification of what went wrong the first time. In other words, the original bris of Parshas Mishpatim was Nizbatl, as the Ramban says, and there was a second bris, which is Bahar and Bechukosai, and some of this is the Tikkun. We have to understand, in what sense is this the Tikkun? How is the second covenant better than the first covenant? The first one was Nizbatl, and somehow this one is more lasting. Now let's talk about the first difference. Why in the original bris there were no brachas and klalas, and why in the second bris are there brachas and Flawless. And it seems to me that the pshat is very, very partial. We have to understand something which Chazal tell us. Chazal tell us in the Gemara of Zara that if not for the Chet Egel, Klal Yisrael would have been free from the Malach HaMavis. Klal Yisrael would not have experienced death. And uh, that's the Pasuk, Ani Amarti, Himatem, Kulchem, Baruch said, I said you should be like angels, but alas, you will die like human beings, and that's a consequence of the Chet But the original Maimed Harsinai would have entailed 
a bitl of the Malach Amalas. The post understanding of that is, is that Maimon Har Sinai would have been a return to Gan Eden. It would have been a return to the Matzah of Kaidem HaChet. As we know that Adam Arishin, before the Chet of the Etadas, was in a very, very, very lofty Madrega. And the Chet of the Etadas was Makalkel, it ruined everything. It totally diminished the stature of Adam Arishin, of human beings. And Maimon HaSinai would have been a restoration of man, of Klau Yisrael, to the Madreg of Odom Harishim Kaidem Achet. And one of the things we know, that if not for the Chet, there would have been no Misa, there would have been no death. So Chazal tell us that Maimon HaSinai would have entailed freedom from the Malach HaMavis. That means that Klau Yisrael would have been restored to the Madreg of Odom Harishim Kaidem Achet. Now what do we know about Odom Harishim Kaidem Achet? We know an amazing thing. Besides the fact he didn't die, the Rishonim tell us he didn't have a Yitzhah as we do. And the Ramban, the Sfarno explain that to Odom Harishim, doing the right thing was instinctive. It was intuitive. It wasn't something you had to think through. It wasn't something you had to reason. His natural instinct, his natural impulse was to do the right thing. And the question, of course, that can be asked is, so how did the Chet come about? But the consequence of the Chet is that Adam Harishin now has to grapple with moral dilemmas, determining right from wrong, making decisions, what to do, etc. That was the change that was brought about through the, through the Chet. And undoubtedly, it would have been the same thing. That if Klau Yisrael would have been able to maintain the Madrega of Maimut HaSinai, if not for the Chet Regal, and again, the question is, how did the Chet Regal come about? But if they would have been able to maintain the Madrega of before the Chet Regal, they would have been on a Madrega where doing the right thing would have been natural and intuitive. They wouldn't have a Yitzhahara. In the same way, they were free from the Malach HaMavas, they'd be free from the Yitzhahara too. But somehow they couldn't maintain their madrega, and they sunk back, and they became very much human again. But on the madrega of other Mauritian kind of lachet, there's no need for rewards and punishments. Rewards and punishments are necessary for people that grapple with moral choices, and they have to decide, should I do X, should I do Y? So by putting in warnings, blessings, and curses, you uh, can tip the scales of judgment in favor of a given course of action. Because now it's just not only a question of what's right and wrong, it's also a question of <laughs> what's expedient, what's going to be good for me, what's going to help, is it going to hurt me, and so on and so forth. But Kaidem, the Cheto Ego, before the Cheto Ego, and the Madrega that Klal Yisrael was, there was no need for them to be threatened. You better do the right thing or else you'll be punished, or you better do the right thing and be rewarded, it was totally unnecessary. If they would have been on the Madrega of Adam Rish and Kaidem Achet, Mamash like Malachim, so doing the right thing would have been natural, would have been intuitive. So therefore, in the first bris, there were no brachas, no claws, no threats. You know, to put in a threat, a warning, you know, you better do the right thing or else there's a claw, would have been totally demeaning to them on the Madrega where they're meant to be. You know, they were meant to be in the Madrega where doing the right thing was natural, it was intuitive, so of course there's no brachas and kolos there. But the Chet HaEgel ruined everything. Right? The Chet HaEgel brought them crashing back to earth very much as mortal human beings, human beings who, who never have a Yetzirah and have to make moral choices. At that point, that's the necessity for brachas and kolos. So the second bris has brachas and kolos, whereas the first one didn't, because the first one was given to a Klal Yisrael, which from the mind with Har Sinai was in the Madrig of Malachim. And the Kwisas Bris was the day after the revelation, so they're still in the Madrig of Malachim. The Chetvegel didn't transpire yet. So, of course, they're not Madrig. You don't give brachs and claws, you don't give threats, you don't give warnings. Right? The second Bris is after the Chetvegel. Now it's reality. Now we're very much human beings. So, the Kwisas Bris with human beings, that requires brachs and claws.
Let me share with you a very beautiful <laughs> thought that Basil Lady says. There's a pasuk which says, "All the move Hashem." Hashem saves man and animal. So the Gemara Kulon says, "What does this mean to Adam Uvehema?" So these are the Gemara says, "Ben Adam Harun and Bedas. They're very, very smart. When they see men Asman Kebehema, they make themselves like behemoths. Very smart people who make themselves like animals." He brings another medrash, it's actually a particular kana, which says also the same thing that people turned to Rebbe Shlomo and said, "We are people, yet we follow you like behemoths. We follow you like animals." So what does it mean to, that's like a praiseworthy thing, to find a local rough like an animal? So the Salevi says a beautiful chat. He brings the Gemara in Kedushin, the Chavbeis. The Gemara in Kedushin says like this, that um, you can be Kona and Eved, you can acquire an Eved with Mashiach. If you pull the Eved, that's a Kenyan. Someone says, how do you pull the Eved? He says, you grab onto the Eved, you physically pull it. But if you merely call the Eved, and the Eved comes, that's not a Mashiach. So you ask the question from Abraisa that it says, well, you want to be kind of animal. If you call the animal, the animal comes, it is called a Mashiach. So what's the difference between an Eved and an animal? That an Eved calling the Eved and the Eved coming is not called a Mashiach, and by an animal calling the animal, the animal coming is called a Mashiach. So the Gemara says, no, there's a big difference. That the Hema Adaita Demarak of them. Right, the animal, when you call the animal, the animal comes, the animal is responding to the master's call. It says the Evid Adaita Demarak of it. An Evid does it with his own mind. Meaning, if I call an animal and the animal comes, it's not that the animal made a decision to come. An animal doesn't make decisions, an animal acts on the basis of its instinct. So if the animal comes in response to your call, apparently that's part of the instinct of the animal to respond to your call. That's called the Mashiach. Therefore, your calling caused the motion. That's why it's an act of Mashiach. If I call a human being, the human being makes a decision. Right? Should I come? Should I not come? So therefore, his coming is not caused by your call. There's no causal relationship between your call and his coming. You call, then he decided, should I respond or should I not respond? Therefore, he comes. But that's not, it's not called the Mashiach. It's not called you pulled him. Therefore, it's not called the Kenyan. Yeah, if I physically grab the Evan, I pull him. That's a Mashiach. But if I call him and he comes, it's not. So it says the base lady, what do you see from here? The difference between a behemoth and an Adam is that a behemoth responds intuitively. Its impulse is to respond to the call of the master. So a human being has intelligence. So a human being, you, know, you, you, you call it, decides, should I come, should I not come? So an Eved Hashem, the ideal of an Eved Hashem is to be a Ruman Bidas. Of course, human beings have Das. But we may see an Asim and Behemoth, make themselves like Behemoths. That their response to the call of Hashem should be not something which they decide, yeah, it makes sense, I think I'll do that. But rather, it should be something which is intuitive, something which is natural. Of course, God calls, I, I come without thinking. That's really the difference between before Mountain Torah and after Mountain Torah. Or I say before the Chet Regal, after the Chet Regal, before the Chet Regal, and after the Chet Regal. Before the Chet, man in the moral realm was like a behemoth. Of course, in the intellectual realm, he was uh, very much an Adam, right? His, his superior intelligence was given to him in order to understand, to know. But in terms of the area of moral choice, he was like an animal, meaning he followed how could have brought his world naturally. So he was exactly that, a Roman bedas, who may seem an Asim Kabahima. He was very, very intelligent, but he was like an animal in the area of moral choice. He followed intuitively, by virtue of impulse and instinct, he followed the call of the Yubana Shalala. After the Chet of the Eitz Hadas, and again, after the Chet of Ego, we became people again. We became people again. And people make decisions, they make choices. And that's already a very, very, very different thing. That's why you need the, the Ein Shem. You need the Ein Shem, the Brachas, the Klolas, because that becomes a a factor. Now, there's a very interesting thing about the Chet and Gan Eden that we find. 
And this is a, a Gemara Mstachim. The Gemara tells us an amazing thing. It says that after the Chet, HaKadosh Baruch decreed on Adam Arishim, Kaitz v'dar dar tatzmiach lach, the land will produce thorns and thistles, v'yachal to asayis of asadeh, and you'll eat grass. So originally it was Nigzar and Adam Harishim to eat grass. No longer would he eat the fruits of Gan Eden, he'd eat grass. So the Gemara Pesachim says that at that moment, Zalgo Ein of Damaos, Adam Harishim burst into tears. And he said, Ani v'chamayri, yoch lubei v'sechad, that I and my donkey are going to eat at one trough. Because the animals eat grass. So I'm going to eat grass too. So he was, he was sarachim, he was shattered. So the Gemara said, okay, I'll tell you what, by the sweat of your brow, you'll eat bread. It's important to understand that the klala of is not a klala that a Kodesh put on Adam. It's a klala that Adam brought on himself. Nitzat HaKodesh Baruch would have been in the Lachalta Asais of Asad. You'll eat grass. But Adam Marishan was so hurt by that, by the prospect of being like an animal. So... Akhil Baruch relented, and Akhil Baruch said, okay, I'll tell you what, and that klala we suffer from this very day. See, it's an amazing thing that we think, as human beings, that the fact we have superior intelligence, which enables us to live in a much higher standard than animals, because animals walk around without clothing, and they eat grass, and they live in uh, who knows where, they drink water out of uh, ponds, uh, that's not a life. Says so we build ourselves houses and we wear nice clothes and we eat well. We go to restaurants and we have cookbooks, and, and everything is beautiful. Right? Is really not a blessing. Adam Harishim thought it was a blessing. Right? He asked for it. I don't want to be like an animal. I need the chamur yochel be v'sechad. So the brother said, Okay, I'll tell you what. It's really a curse. Adam thought it was a blessing. In reality, it's a curse. We've taken the gift of our intelligence. And now we've subserviated that gift of intelligence to satisfy our material needs. And that's, that's a, a, a terrible shame. In other words, we were given this gift of intelligence in order to come to understand the Rivana Shalayla. As a result of the Chet, now we have to use this intelligence to discern between right and wrong. Okay? That's a halbutzar. But now we've chosen that that intelligence should not be used for those lofty purposes, rather it should be used to be able to satisfy our desire for a more comfortable life, to eat well and to live well, and so on and so forth. In other words, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's mamasha, it's a, it's a shame. It's, it's, we think about it, it's a, it's a humiliation. We were given such a gift we were meant not to have the Eitz Hara, and in Gan Eden we would have used it to come to understand and know and recognize the Rebbe Shalom, as the Rambam says in the second paragraph of Aaron Nebuchim, that that's what man would have used his intelligence for, if not for the Chet of the Das. Now we, we're nifshal on the Chet of the Das, and now we have the Eitz Hara, so now we're meant to use this intelligence to make moral decisions between right and wrong. Okay, that's also a very, very noble use of the intelligence, but instead, what did we use it for? We decided, no, we need that intelligence to be able to eat well. That it shouldn't be that Aniva chamari yoch Instead, I need this superior intelligence for what? In order to be able to eat bread. And bread is just a symbol of all the ways in which the human lifestyle is superior to the animal lifestyle. So we build skyscrapers and superhighways and the uh, computer technology, and so on and so forth. This is all just ways of living better. And that's what we use our intelligence for. And that really is, is a curse that Adam brought on him, on himself. If our conjecture is correct, that when Claudius stood, stood at our Sinai, they really were going back to the master of Adam Rishon Kedem Chet. And the Chet Egel really is bringing them back to being mortal. 
it restores the Yitzhara, it restores the Malachamavas, but there's another Sakana that we may make the same mistake that Adam Harishim made. Just like Adam Harishim made a mistake after the Chet, it was almost a second Chet, and he said, that this gift of intelligence I will use to satisfy my material needs, not for the noble purposes for which I was given it, but instead I will use that superior intelligence to satisfy my material needs. That's the danger of recurring again. Now, in the Midbar, it wasn't such a danger, because in the Midbar, all their physical needs were, <coughs> were satisfied. They had gone, they had the Be'er, they had their Nana covered, right? their clothes grew with them. So there was no danger in the Midbar that they would use their intelligence for bettering their material lives. But the question really is in Eretz Yisrael, when it comes to Eretz Yisrael, what's going to be? I believe that of the many lessons in the mitzvahs of Shemit and Yoibol, this is really one of those lessons. So let's understand one halacha of Shemit and Yoibol, and it's a halacha which does not emerge from Shemit and Yoibol as it's written in Parshas Mishpatim, but only from the expansion of Shemit and Yoibol as it's written in Bahar Bukhukhausai. There's a halacha like this. There's a halacha that in the seventh year, everything is hefker. And it says in the Pasuk, that the produce of Shemitah should be for you to eat. For you, for your servants, to live hemtucha and for the animals, the Bachaya Sherbar Telcha and the Chayas, the wild animals in your land, Tia Kotvlasa Lechem. So Chazal Darshan from this Pasuk that uh, a human being is only allowed to eat the produce of Shemitah as long as it's available to the animals in the field. But if it's kolo, l'chayim and asada, if the wild animals can't eat it anymore, then uh, the human being isn't allowed to eat it anymore either. So even if the human being brought some into his house, but once it's no longer found in the field, the human being can't eat it. Meaning that in Shemitah, in some sense, the human being is like an animal, right? The human being has no greater privileges than an animal has. Now, in Shemitah, it's put that way. There's just a heckish. But in the case of Yoival, which, of course, Yoival is the, the advanced level. Yoival is the Madrega we achieve after seven Shemitahs. There, the Pasuk is even more explicit. The Pasuk says that Ki yovel hi, kodesh ti elochem, min hasoda toichlu es tibuasa. You will eat the produce from the field. And again, Rashi says the same halacha, that only as long as it's found in the field for the animals are you allowed to eat it. But here, the, the emphasis is more, that you're going to eat it from the field. What does that mean? It means that essentially you're like an animal. Because what does that mean? It means exactly like this, that that the Shabbos Ha'aretz, the resting from labor, right, essentially is an opportunity to live without the curse of B'zeas HaTach We put a curse on ourselves, right, that instead of wanting to eat the Ace of Asada, instead of wanting to eat from the field, the grass from the field, we said, no, we don't want to be like animals. We want to be human beings. What well, a human being? A human being eats bread, right, something which he produces through his own effort, Right? The Zayasapacha by the sweat of his brow. And that's really not a blessing, it's really a curse, because that's the curse of our modern lives. We've subserviated our intelligence to the satisfaction of our material needs. So the Rebunish Lailam creates a corrective that once every seven years, we have an opportunity to go back to being an animal. In other words, what does it mean to be an animal? That, that our sustenance, our parnas, our eating, is no longer a function of our effort. We don't plant, we don't plow, we don't harvest, we don't produce, right? Minasara toklos tvuasa. We eat from the field like the animals, and therefore there's a halacha that only as long as the animals can eat. Once it's kala lachaya minasara, that once it's not available for the animals, you can't eat it either. In other words, essentially what Shemitah is, Shemitah is the, the corrective 
to the curse of the Zayas HaPecha Teich HaLechem which we brought in ourselves. When you think about it, it, it really makes sense. If you go back to Parashat Mishpatim, Parashat Mishpatim presents Shemitah as a whole different issue. It says, Vashviyas Tishmetena Unetashta, that you should abandon the field, and the poor should eat. So anyone reading Parashat Mishpatim would understand that what's the idea of Shemitah? The Shemitah is an opportunity to provide for the poor. Right? Let everything be hefker, so that the poor can also have. So it's not um, something which is meant to teach the farmer something. It's really, uh, in a sense, redistributive justice. <laughs> we're going to level the playing field. Why should I be the rich farmer who has for himself, and everyone else is poor and does without? So it's, no, let it, once every seven years, let it be hefker, all the poor will eat, and everyone will have. That's how it's expressed in Parshas Mishpatim. But in the expansion, when we expand it in Bahar B'chul Kausai, right, we see a totally different dimension. That the Te'elos of Shemitah is not only for the poor that the poor should have. The Te'elos of Shemitah is for me. It's for the farmer. What do you mean the farmer? The farmer is worse off, right? The, the six years he plants, he plows, he produces, he has, right? And now this seventh year, <laughs> what am I going to eat? He says, no, that's, the, that's exactly it. That the six years, you're a slave to a curse that the other Mauritian brought upon mankind. And now you have an opportunity to be free from that. Be free from that. Be free from that kilko, which is a consequence of chet. Why was this introduced, dafka, in the second bris? Because fakir, in the first bris, it wouldn't have been necessary to have this halach of Shemitah and Yaibo. Because the first verse, we have no Yitzhara, no temptation. So, of course, our planting would not have been something that would become the obsession of our lives. Right? Maybe we'd have to plant. You know, in any case, you know, we are human beings. Who knows what the Cheshvenes would have been? But, but it wouldn't have been something that would have absorbed every fiber of our being and thinking. Because after the Cheta Ego, where we became human again, now there's this danger of, of perhaps sinking into exactly the B'zayas HaPechet HaChalechem of Bodom HaRishon. So the Baruch gave us a mitzvah of Shemitah and Yaibo, that we should understand the beauty of a life which is not devoted to the satisfaction of our material desires. Right? It's a life where we could enjoy the pleasure of eating Min HaSodeh from the field and not the curse of Bezayas HaPechet HaChalechem. And the Gorm Pesachim really says this. The Gorm Pesachim says, Abayah says, I, I believe, he says that we would have been so much better off, right, had we not asked for that Bezayas HaPechet HaChalechem. You know, the grass is plentiful. You know, whenever we're hungry, go to the field and eat grass. It would have been wonderful. So it was, it was a claw that we brought in ourselves. He says, but we delude ourselves. We delude ourselves into thinking this is a cover. This is the, what is special about our humanity that we can address our physical needs in such a glorious, grand way, right? It's really the curse of Zayasapecha Teichalechem. We're condemned to the rat race of having to work harder and more stressfully to produce more, to consume more, to have more. And uh, Shemitah gives us an opportunity to step back and say that uh, this is what life could be. It could be a life where, where it's good enough to eat whatever the field gives me and that my mind is free to devote to higher questions and higher purposes. And that's something, that expansion was a necessary part of the Sefer Abris. That the, the second crisis Abris could not present Shemitah in the same way that the other mitzvahs were presented. So as Ramon speaks out, that the Sefer Abris, the second time around, had all the mitzvahs, all the mitzvahs of Mishpatim were in the second Sefer Abris too. But they didn't have to change. Because, because However, the mitzvah was presented the first time around, it could have been presented the second time around. But Shemitah had to be expanded in the Sefer Abris. Because the concept of Shemitah in the first Sefer Abris, right, didn't address the, the problem that the Jews were facing the second time around. The second time around, after the Chetu Ego, they had the danger of sinking into the trap of saying, I need the Chamar Yochlu Beit Vesechad. Wanting the Bizayas HaPechatech HaLechem. So, therefore, for that, the Baruch had to expand and explain how the mitzvah of Shemitah and Yaibo addresses this issue 
Exactly. So therefore, just getting back, that the, the parashis of Bahar and Glucosi, really, you know, there'd be no half a mina to read Kisavo um, before Shavuos. Now, Kisavo is an important parasha, it's brought as clawless warnings, but, but these parashis, Bahar and Glucosi, these are the parashas which are the corrective to the, what went wrong the first time around. So the first time around, Claudius was in a Madrega, and they made a bris, which they couldn't hold on to. So there was going to be a second crisis bris, but that second crisis of bris required parashias, parashias, and glucosae. 